Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nawar Kabani. Uh, I'm here from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, really glad to be here to give this presentation. Normally, I would speak for hours about OAuth and OpenID Connect. It's one of my passion, uh, passion one of my uh, topics that I'm very passionate about. Um, but I'll try to make it as short as possible. I know I have only 25 minutes or even less now. Um, but um, so, uh, quick introduction about me. Um, my name is Noir. Uh, people ask me how to pronounce your name. It kind of sounds like Pinot Noir, you know, like the wine. Um, <clears throat> I am a QA security tester lead at uh, Fidelity National Financial, which is a title insurance company. Um, I, my title officially actually says test architect, but uh, I'm, I'm basically the lead of the QA security team, which basically is responsible of testing um, for security vulnerabilities in our uh, in-house applications. Um, I've been a tester developer, um, and uh, this is a picture of me. Uh, I thought I wasn't sure if there was going to be a, um, <clears throat> a uh, video, so I decided to put a picture since I, there's no face-to-face -face interaction. I took this picture uh, four weeks ago, so be before starting working from home and all of that, then I realized that I changed a little bit since then. So after working from home, I look like this now. Um, this is a more recent picture. Um, if you notice the difference, I just shaved my, uh, um, just had a haircut. Um, the agenda for today, uh, I'm just going to start talking about why I'm giving this presentation. And then I'm going to give a very uh, brief overview, well, I'll try to make a brief, about OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect. Then I'm going to talk about some general risks and mistakes with um, the OAuth protocol and implementation and design mistakes. And then uh, I'm going to give some examples from bug bounty programs, which is, you know, if you notice, the title of this uh, presentation is Lessons Learned from uh, Bug Bounty Programs. <clears throat> so why am I, am I giving this talk? Um, well, the short answer is uh, to spread awareness. Um, I see a lot of um, mistakes and misunderstanding going around about um, modern authorization and authentication protocols, which are, which are OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect and related standards. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a difficult subject and it's a very broad subject. Um, but definitely, it's it, it's a critical subject because you know if you think about it, this is your entry point to your applications, to your systems. You know, authentication and authorization are you know your gateway uh, for the users into your applications. If you have vulnerabilities there, then obviously you have a big problem. Um, OAuth and OpenID are everywhere today. Uh, if you look at single page applications, they commonly use uh, OAuth for um, authorization and authentication. With the widespread of microservices today, you also see these protocols being very widely used. Um, they're replacing older techniques such as using cookies for authentication and session management. They're also replacing SAML uh, in some areas, although I think SAML is still valid and usable for a lot of use cases. Um, there are a lot of common mistakes. Um, either at the design level or at the implementation level. So we're gonna give some examples about some of the common mistakes and the list is really long. So I'm just gonna really just scratch the surface here. Um, one of the things that I have felt about OAuth is that um, there is a, a lack of understanding by everyone. Um, not everyone, of course, but some people don't fully understand uh, these protocols. And this applies to application security analysts or uh, InfoSec uh, specialists, um, especially that a lot of them that I've met, they don't really come from strong development background. And these protocols require you that you understand the web very well and you understand um, application development very well. But it's really not only that. I actually see developers and senior developers who keep struggling with making the right design choices uh, when it comes to OAuth and OpenID Connect. So um, there's definitely a lack of skill set, and um, I'm not sure what the solution is, but this presentation comes in in a way to basically help people kind of like be aware about some of the common mistakes. Um, another problem is these standards seem to be evolving all, with time. There have been some best practices that used to be like, this is the way you do it for native apps and mobile apps, and now there is a change today in what is considered the best practice. and. Um, some of the older kind of like recommendations are 
we find now that they're not really the most secure way of doing things. So now you'll see new recommendations and even new standards or substandards uh, that came to uh, resolve some of the issue, issues that came up uh, over time. Um, now, where do we learn about these mistakes? And that's a problem that I've, I've been thinking about for a while, but recently I've been watching, um, um, I decided that the best way to uh, find you know, common errors and problems in security is not really to look at, you know, you have some valuable resources like OWASP top 10, which, you know, every five years they come out and they gather, you know, user feedback about what are the common mistakes, but they're, first of all, they're very broad uh, problems. And second of all, there are like how you gather this information is very user feedback oriented. Um, so I realized that we actually have growing treasure cove of, um, of data uh, about security vulnerabilities. Um, and that we can tap into that um, repository of information. Um, what matters for, 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 for finding this information about the, 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 the bugs that are important for us, because not everything that we see you know, is necessarily you know, a big problem that is gonna cost us money and, and value, right? So um, there's this famous quote by Einstein that not everything uh, that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So based on that, I wanted to see, okay, what, is, what are the mistakes that really matter here? Like, how do we know that these bugs, you know, a lack of, I don't know, a header, is that really a critical or a high issue or is that a low issue uh, versus, um, I don't know, uh, forging the signature on, on, um, on some certificates, right? So, um, so I went and decided to go to bug bounty programs. And I think that's the, that's the repository of information that I've been talk, talking about. Um, the bug bounty programs are getting um, more uh, widespread and they're, they're getting larger and larger over time. Um, Google um, has paid uh, apparently six and a half million dollars in 2019. Um, in bug bounty programs, think about that six and a half million dollars, um, and they increased their, the maximum prize to one and a half million dollar. One and a half million dollar. If you find a critical security vulnerability in in Google products, uh, this just came, I think, in November. Think about that. One bug could be worth hundred one million and a half. Uh, Apple also increased their maximum uh, limit for bug. Uh, a bounty to a million dollar last year. And then you have programs like uh, you see here, Hacker One, um, the H1 is Hacker One, um, which is a popular crowdsourcing platform um, for bug bounty program. And the other one on the right here, you see uh, Bug Crowd. Um, uh, Hacker One uh, paid $40 million to their um, testers last year in 2019, which is apparently uh, more than all of that they've paid in the years before. So, so this is definitely a growing um, sourcing uh, of bugs. Um, but what's more importantly is that these bugs, a lot of them are publicly disclosed bugs. So you can go and read about them and learn from them. So we have now like an unprecedented um, repository of information that security researchers can use to basically gather empirical information about um, what is going on in the real world today. Um, <clears throat> uh, these bugs, some of them have value. So not, not every bug in the bug bounty programs get assigned a reward. And that depends on the policy of the, of the company that is sponsoring the, the, the program. Um, but, um, but some of them have value assigned. Um, a couple months ago, I remember I was reading uh, PayPal paid about $20,000 for two different bugs each. Uh, to twenty thousand dollar, and there were bugs in like the login screen of PayPal. And if you think about it, actually twenty thousand dollar doesn't sound that high because if somebody were to exploit um, uh, a cross scripting bug in the login screen of PayPal and steal the passwords of users, that's really uh, critical. And um, so, but yeah, so 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 some of them have met a value, and you can use that value as a proxy measure to 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 kind of like get an as an idea of how important these bugs. However, this, this comes with a lot of caveats and, and you have to take it with a big grain of salt um, because you know, um, there are four different reasons I'm not gonna get into right now, but um, you know, companies have different policies for, for how to assign uh, money value to, to bugs. And also different companies have different um, um, prior, priorities, I guess. 
Um, <clears throat> so let me jump right into what is OAuth 2.0. Um, OAuth 2.0 is um, a protocol that allows users to delegate access to their own resources, the re resources they own to a third party application. Uh, this is a protocol used mainly for API authorization. Uh, it was designed for API in, uh, in the first place, but it can be used for a lot of other contexts, but it is really for API in the first place. Um, there are different scenarios where this can be used, it can be used for server to server authentication scenarios, it can be used in browser based apps, it can be used on native apps and mobile apps, and it can even be used today in like consoles and TV, smart TVs and things like that. Um, it is also important to focus on the fact that OAuth itself is designed to be an authorization protocol, not an authentication protocol. And that's a critical distinction. I don't have time to get into the details for that, but I always love to put this picture here. And just to draw the attention that you know, OAuth stands for open authorization. And it's really for authorization, not for authentication. All right, quick example. I'm just gonna run through a quick scenario or actually a quick example of real world use case of OAuth that I faced recently. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with mint.com. Mint.com is a website that you can use to collect. Um, basically it gathers the, your bank statements and um, sorry, and transaction information from your uh, bank accounts from different sources and put them in one place where you can um, uh, do your budgets and and um, get a quick look at your 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 money and financials. Um, one of the things that Mint has to be able to do is, or the main thing is that it has to be able to connect to your bank and on your behalf and get and collect your data. And historically, this used to be done by uh, Mint asking you to provide them with your uh, credentials for these banks. So you would basically give Mint.com your Bank of America.com. Um, username and password, you'll give them your Chase password, you'll give them whatever bank accounts you have. And obviously a lot of security risks come with that. So um, uh, recently they released, uh, they started releasing a new feature where um, now instead of asking you for a password, they use now OAuth to um, ask you to authorize them, mint.com or Intuit, which is the parent company, to access the bank on your behalf but they're not no longer collecting your password. What happens is that they ask you to go to your bank. And here in this case, I have a screenshot of Citibank website where Citi is asking me, hey, do you want to allow this um, application to access your um, credit card information um, on your behalf? And if I click on authorize, right? Um, if I click on authorize access, then it will basically grant that access to mint.com. Mint.com will never get my password, but they will get instead an access token that allows them to access my bank. And if you notice here in the URL, you see the OAuth2 endpoint. So that's an indicator that they're using OAuth. In this example, I want to grant mint.com access to my bank accounts, statements, and balances. From terminology point of view, I am the resource owner. I own you know, my statements. These are the resources. Um, want to grant client, uh, mint.com, which is the client, um, access uh, to my bank accounts, which are, um, you know, the XYZ bank here, or Citibank in this case, was the authorization provider and also the resource provider. Um, and the resources that I'm giving access to them, these are called scope, you know, what permissions I'm given um, to mint.com. So the flow looks like this. I go to uh, enter in my browser, the, the, the client, you know, the URL of the client application that I want to use, the client redirects me, um, or maybe sometimes it shows a pop-up, but either way, it redirects me to um, the authorization provider, in this case, like Citibank in this example. Um, Citibank will authenticate me, right, and ask me for my consent. Um, if I approve that Citibank has access to my, uh, or uh, rather Mint has access to my uh, ba uh, bank information, then um, um, the authorization provider or Citibank will generate another redirect back to the browser to redirect me back to the client app with an, what's something called authorization code uh, passed in the URL. That authorization code is then sent back to the client to mint.com and which on its um, own, mint.com use that 
uh, authentication code in, in addition to its own client secret um, that only Mint.com has, um, that it has generated um, uh, with, with um, Citibank, of course. And they use the authentication or the authorization code to uh, essentially uh, generate a new access token. So now the, the uh, authorization provider will verify that the authorization code is valid. It's the same one that it had just issued earlier, right, um, in this step. And then it will, uh, uh, if it's valid, then it will generate a new access token that can be used to, um, uh, that, that the client can use to uh, make a request to the API. So from that point on, Mint.com will be able to access the API that Citibank provides uh, using the access token. And um, every time, of course, the resource provider has to validate it's a valid token and then return the requested data. So some considerations about this flow. Um, the authorization code is the first kind of like token that gets generated. And this one is passed in the URL and it's only meant for the redirect. And it's meant to be sent to the user, to the client, uh, or really the, the user agent, um, um, so that they can exchange that and, and send it back to the client app and they can exchange it for the access token. This authorization code should be only usable only one time. It's usually very short lived, so five minutes or less, because it's done in, in, as part of a series of redirects that are all automated. Um, and um, once it's used, it should expire after that, right? Um, later, you get the access token. The access token uh, usually is a medium life span. Um, I've seen anything from 15 minutes to two hours. That's very, these are very common values. Um, the, the access token typically is only stored on the server, on the backend server, at least in this flow. Um, and it's usually, so it's usually not provided to the, to the client, except in, in the cases of, of native app. Um, and then um, it is also specific to the client and the resource owner. So, so it has a combination that, you know, if I use this token, this token can be only used for a specific user and uh, to a specific client. So you can't use um, a token that was generated for a different application uh, to access the API. Um, there's also a refresh token that is used for uh, kind of like to extend the, the offline access uh, uh, from the client to the authorization server. So this way the, um, the client can make um, um, API calls to, in this case, Citibank in my, in my example, um, for indefinite amount of time. Usually refresh tokens um, are good until they are revoked. Uh, sometimes they might have some lifespan of like a year or so. They're usually very, very long lived. Um, they're meant for offline access and refresh tokens are used to generate new access tokens since access tokens generally expire within an hour or so. Um, another security consideration is that the client secret, which I kind of like quickly showed you in the, in the, um, in the flow, the client secret uh, is usually only used when you have a secure web server that, that, that is doing the um, token exchange um, um, flow. Um, you don't want to give this to uh, end users. Um, there's no point in, in like if you put it in your native app, in your single page application, you have a big problem here. So the client secret can be only used when you have a back end web server uh, that is managing um, access to the API. Um, there's a state variable that is passed, you know, the, when the flow starts, you, the client has to generate a state variable and at the end of the flow, the client has to verify that the state variable hasn't changed and it's still valid. This is important to prevent some trust set request forgery attacks. There are also, you are, a lot of redirects in this flow, as you noticed. So all of the redirects are always subject to, you know, the standard open redirect issues that we've known about for many years in, 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 you know, in any application. Um, you want to make sure that the redirect is always validated or the redirect URI is always validated um, by both the uh, authorization provider and the client. Otherwise, you can end up with situations where um, a malicious attacker can uh, force the user to get redirected to a malicious site and steal their tokens. There, the, the flow that I just described was the authorization code flow. 
because as you notice, there was an authorization code that get passed in the redirect um, 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 flow. Uh, there are other flows. There's implicit flow, which is used generally in single page applications and sometimes in native apps like mobile apps. It's becoming less encouraged to be used, let me say that, um, because it has a problem that it doesn't support client secret. Uh, the reason is you don't, you know, the client in this case is a client, is, is an app that the user has um, access to or has control over, right? Native app or single page application. And you don't want to put client secret there. there there's no point because once you put it there, then it's public. So in, in, in this scenario, th this, this uh, flow is generally considered less secure than authorization code. Resource owner password is even a, even worse uh, uh, flow from security perspective because in that flow, a client will capture the actual credentials of uh, the user and then pass them uh, to the authorization server. This flow is only used, is only recommended for legacy apps where you don't have um, like a mainframe app, for example, where you don't have a browser and um, the only way to invoke the, the or, or get access tokens is through um, basically getting the password from the user directly and pass, in, pass it uh, to the authorization provider. There's client credential flow, which is used in server to server authentication. This is more like a service account flow. But then there are a few other flows. The refresh token flow is really a subflow of the above. You know, it can be used with authorization code flow. It's just a way to extend um, offline access. Uh, there's device flow that is more recent and that, that you can see now in uh, things where you don't have a web browser, for example, smart TV. Um, if you wanna authorize your TV to access your Netflix account, then the device flow is what's used here. Uh, number seven is authorization code with Pixie. PKCE. Pixie, actually this, this came uh, to solve the issues with the implicit flow where you don't have client secret. Uh, this is actually today the recommended flow for native apps like mobile apps, especially, where you're able to invoke uh, a web browser to do the authentication process, but um, uh, you don't have the ability to use client secret because it's, it's a public client. And then you have SAML bear assertion profile that is used for compatibility with SAML authentication um, flows. Token types, there are two main types based on how they work. There are the bearer token, which basically says every time you see a client making a request, if the request has that token, then this request, and if the token is valid, then the request is authorized. Uh, the bearer token is doesn't change between different requests until it expires, of course. There's another uh, type of token called the MAC token or message access code token. And this one relies on cryptographic signature of the request. So, so this, every time you have a new request, basically you hash the request and using a secret, uh, you generate a token that is um, only valid for the specific request. This is helpful to prevent um, kind of like uh, replay attacks. However, I have not seen this flow in practice yet. I've read about it a lot, but I still haven't seen an example of somebody using that flow yet. I'm sure it is there, but I haven't seen it. The bearer token is by far the most common scenario. Then based on format, you have uh, JWT tokens, which is JSON web token. That's very common and you'll see it everywhere. Um, but you can also have uh, opaque tokens, which is just like randomly generated long string, right? And those are, um, uh, only uh, comprehensible by the authorization provider, um, the client cannot see inside them. Uh, this is a quick example of what JWT token looks like. There are three, uh, three parts. Uh, each part is base64 encoded. Uh, the first part is the header, which defines how the, 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 the token is, is signed. The second part is the claims, which is you know who the user is, what they have access to when the token was issued. And the last part is a signature that uh, protects the token from tampering. Um, I'm gonna skip OpenID Connect since we're short on time, but very quickly, I really just wanna say this is the authentication protocol that was based on OAuth 2.0. So while OAuth 2.0 wasn't intended for authentication, OpenID Connect came to solve the authentication problem and it really just sits on top of OAuth. Now, 
I'm going to jump into some examples from what I've seen uh, from bug bounty programs. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, you know, HackerOne and BugCrowd are like platforms for um, where you can see a lot of publicly disclosed uh, vulnerabilities. You just go there and they're public. You don't even have to sign in. You can go there and search for um, bugs uh, with specific keywords. And this is like a quick search I did, and this is really just part of the, of the screen. I had hundreds of results, but a quick result, you know, quick search shows that, you know, on OAuth, I get several, you know, bugs, and some of them are like in big, you know, apps like Uber and Twitter and, um, and so on. What, that were paid thousands of dollars um, for 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 the people who found these bugs. So, um, if we take a look at a couple of them, um, this example, this is Twitter, or more specifically Periscope, which is um, um, a platform owned by Twitter. And in this case, um, the user or the um, uh, the tester was able to find that uh, there was unvalidated redirect in the redirect URI. So rather than redirecting the user to periscope.tv after they log in with Twitter, they can be redirected back to attacker.com slash periscope.tv, which is obviously you know, a malicious site or you know example of a malicious site, it's not a real one. Um, this bug, although this is classified here as cross-site scripting, this is not really cross-site scripting, this is an open redirect. Um, this bug was paid $7,000, and I think this is fascinating. And this is very, very, like, if you think about it, it's very simple and basic type of issue. Um, another example of unvalidated redirects, in this case, uh, Facebook um, or, uh, and Uber. Um, a combination of, you know, logging into Uber with Facebook. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not sure about Facebook. There's, there's no Facebook here, I think. Oh, it is Facebook. Yeah, it is using Facebook uh, login. Um, essentially, it's more complex here in this scenario. There's a chain of redirects, but they lead out to essentially be, having the user being redirected to a malicious site. Um, this example here uh, is actually cross-site scripting through redirect URL. So it's a, it's a probably a combination of unvalid, unvalidated redirect, but also the way that they were uh, presenting the, the redirect back to the user, it was possible for the attacker to inject uh, a script, uh, therefore across a scripting. And if you think about it, as I mentioned earlier, across a scripting on the authentication process is really dangerous because it allows an attacker to steal either password or access tokens, essentially account takeover, right? So, um, uh, next example, Shopify. Um, it's really a privilege escalation. The details of these bugs were not fully disclosed, but they basically say that there was a lack of validation of the claims in the token that is passed um, to um, the Stocky app here, and this is called the Stocky app, um, uh, uh, part of Shopify. So privilege escalation, if you're not validating the claims or maybe you're not validating that the, the token is signed by the, uh, the, the, the party that issued the, the token, uh, then it's easy to tamper with the token and inject whatever you want. And that can lead to either account takeovers or privilege escalation issues. Um, here's another example of um, spoofing tokens. In this case, the JWT token uh, was spoofable or forgeable. And the reason this was possible is because the, you know, the key that is used to sign the token was actually in the JavaScript code <laughs> in the client app. So back to the point that, you know, you don't give the client secret or, or any secrets to public clients, you know, a, a browser or JavaScript app is a public client. When you give it to users, then it's no longer a secret. So um, in this case, um, the, uh, the tester was able to find that the, 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 the secret that was used to generate the tokens was in the JavaScript code, and they were able to generate spoofed tokens and uh, bypass the authentication and the authorization flow. Um, this is my last example, um, CSRF on OAuth. That seems to be also a pretty common problem, and there are a lot of different techniques to prevent that. You know, the general technique is to use a CSRF token and you validate that. But in the case of OAuth protocol, there's also a state variable that has, you know, value or has importance in, in preventing CSRF attacks that um, a lot of developers don't think much about it because state, the, the, 
initial purpose initial purpose when state parameter was included in the RFC of OAuth, it wasn't meant for security. It wasn't meant for CSRF protection. It was meant to encapsulate the state of the application before the authorization uh, flow happens. But it turned out that it has critical uh, value in preventing CSRF attacks uh, in, in authorization, actually more like implicit code flows. Um, so I mentioned again, the token hijacking with CSRF for cross-site request forgery. Um, again, using the state parameter is critical here. Um, leaking authorization codes or access tokens through unvalidated redirects, we talked about that. Token hijacking by switching clients. When you validate um, the access token, um, you always wanna validate that it is meant for the client that generated that token. Um, sometimes client side vulnerabilities in you know, a cross scripting uh, allows you to steer access tokens because you know back in the day when we used cookies for, for managing session, uh, cookies had an HTTP only flag that you know a lot of us are familiar with that is meant to prevent JavaScript from accessing the token. But in the case of a single page application, for example, where um, uh, JavaScript needs to access the token because it needs to pass it to the API, um, there's no equivalent to um, HTTP only in uh, for access, access tokens. And access tokens are often stored in the web storage, in the web browser storage. So in case you have a cross site scripting issue, for example, in your application, then your access tokens are immediately exposed to the attacker. Uh, finally, um, well, not really finally, but uh, exposure of client secret. I mentioned that, you know, this is, seems to be a pretty common issue, you know, when, when developers put the client secret in their mobile app, for example, and they release it, you know, a mobile app can be reverse engineered. Uh, it's easy to get those client secrets. Uh, more things to consider, you know, always, Enforce HTTPS. I don't even know why I'm mentioning that. Everybody should know that by now. Um, no HTTPS means everything is compromised, right? You know, the whole flow is, you know, is useless if you don't have HTTPS everywhere. Um, only use the permissions that the app needs. Validate, 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 redirect URI, state, nonce, JWT signatures, whether the token has expired or not, um, and the um, that the client is really the that the tokens are and the authorization code is issued to the right client. Um, there's one final risk that I found very interesting. It's not really a risk in OAuth itself, but it was um, more of a social engineering um, attack that um, came up a couple of years ago on Google Docs uh, or Google. And I don't know if you look at this screenshot, if you notice something weird about this screenshot. This was warm that spread out very quickly between um, Gmail users, and you basically get an email from somebody you know uh, that says, hey, I shared a document with you, click on this link to open the document, and the link is a Google link. So it's not like we've trained users to look at the links and validate the, the, the domain of the link. In this case, it was a Google link because it was, um, you know, a request to, to use the uh, OAuth flow in Google to provide access to a third party application and the third party application name was Google Docs. Now this is not the real Google Docs. This is a fake Google Docs app that wanted to access uh, the user's email, read, send, delete, and manage your email. It also wanted to access your contacts. So for a lot of users who are not really aware of social engineering, and even like people who are trained on social engineering phishing attacks, uh, this is difficult to spot because there's the URL here on this page was Google, right? So there's not a lot of things that we teach users to avoid apply here. Um, but essentially, you know, Google Docs, you know, the really the only red flag that I would think of that, you know, why would Google Docs need access to your email? I mean, Google has access to Google, right? So it shouldn't really need to ask for this permission. So it spread out very quickly. And I think millions of users were impacted within like a few hours. Um, so I thought that was a very interesting attack. Summary, OAuth vulnerabilities are very common, unfortunately. Um, there are too many points of failure. The protocol is complex and it's evolving. Um, the consequences of a vulnerability can be severe. You know, an account takeover, an authorization bypass or authentication bypass sometimes, privilege escalation, et cetera. And uh, I think we're gonna see more and more of those problems as you know this is becoming more prevalent. And I really think there's a short 
shortage of skill, skill set, not skillet, skill set, um, uh, of people who understand these protocols and who are able to find issues and to also defend against issues like that. And with that, uh, I hope I didn't go over time. Well, I guess I did. Um, <laughs> This is Yvette, yeah, you did, it's okay. Um, and I am actually gonna jump in and have you uh, go answer questions on Slack. Um, on Slack, got it. Yes. I will answer questions on Slack. Thank you everyone, I really yeah. appreciate that. Thanks Thank Noir, you. we appreciate it. Thank you Yvette, thank you.